how does tradition work? Well, in a sense, the whole is contained in all the parts. So if we look at one thread of the traditional liturgy, we will see that although it might seem complicated at first, the results are very simple. That through the sacraments and the saints, we have this marvelous connection with heaven. And these two channels can be simplified even further to sacrifice the basis of our redemption. Again, a word on the complexity. If you were to board a plane and looked in the cockpit and saw all those instruments and you think, oh, this is too complicated, I'm not getting on this plane. Well, no, we're not worried about that because it's the pilot's job to understand how to fly the plane. Or if you want to use your mobile to call someone, you don't say, well, I don't understand the engineering or the coding of this phone, so I'm not going to use it. You just pick it up and call. There's other people who understand how it works. And so the job of the priests and the religious is to devote themselves to this liturgy. And they do this as a service for the whole church, including all those whose duties of state will keep them too busy to be so devoted to the liturgy. Everyone has their own level of participation in the prayers and the sacraments. So the example we'll look at here is the feast day of St. Chrysanthus and Daria, husband and wife, martyred in Rome at the end of the third century. Their feast day is the 25th of October. And the Roman martyrology tells us that after bearing many sufferings on account of their confession of Christ, the emperor had them cast into a sand pit on the Salarian Way, and they were buried alive under earth and stones. Now, traditionally, the martyrology would be recited in choir during the hour of prime, or else in some monasteries like Vizhny Brod, they read the martyrology each day in the chapter meeting. And it's anticipated. It's said the day before the feast. So it's an early notice of what feast is coming up the next day. In the seminary I was at, it would be read out at the beginning of lunch. We'd all keep silence and listen to the martyrology. And sometimes when the descriptions of the martyrdoms were particularly brutal, you didn't necessarily want to eat much lunch. Then in the evening, First Vespers might well present the saints to you with the oratio. And certainly in Matins, one learns more about the particular saints whose feast it is. Matins can be anticipated the afternoon or evening beforehand, especially for secular priests, for monks or religious in choir. It can be sung during the night or at 3 a.m. And we get these details that Chrysanthus and Daria were a husband and wife of noble birth, but glorious for their faith, which the wife learnt from her husband. They brought to Christ a great number of persons at Rome, she women and he men. Therefore, the prefect Celerinus caused them to be taken and gave them over to Claudius the tribune, who bade Chrysanthus to be tormented by the soldiers, all bound as he was, but all his bonds break, and so likewise the shackles wherein his feet were afterwards fastened. Then was Chrysanthus sewn up in an ox hide and set in the full heat of the sun, and thereafter chained hand and foot and cast into a dark prison. But the chains dropped off from him, and the place was filled with light. This is wonderfully meaningful how the dark prison becomes full of light, how his bonds break off, because the word of God cannot be bound, and neither can God's saints. Their souls can't be bound. They're rising to heaven, even while they're suffering on earth. And Daria was hailed to a brothel, but God kept her from insult, a lion guarding her, and herself always wrapped in prayer. Lastly, they were both of them led to a sand pit on the Salarian Way, where they were thrown alive into a hole and buried in stones, and so were not divided in winning the victory of martyrdom. Husband and wife joined by the sacrament, they died together and entered heaven, God's martyrs. This reading you'll encounter pretty much every year, unless it should be displaced by a greater feast. And so slowly, the priests and religious build up a familiarity with the saints in the calendar. Tragically, in the last century, there were many who doubted the authenticity of this liturgical testimony. They would say, how could a dark prison become light? Or how could a lion guard one of God's saints from being insulted? And with a rash spirit of modernity, we will see how the Novus Ordo devastated this feast, but how sensible scientific investigation has in fact upheld much of it. 
affirming that we should have confidence and trust in what the Church has for centuries presented to us. The prayer for the two martyrs, which comes at the end of Matins and or Lords, is also that in the Mass. May the prayer of your blessed martyrs, Chrysanthus and Daria, defend us, O Lord, that we may ever enjoy the loving help of those whom we honour by this celebration. And a great advantage of praying in Latin is, whereas anyone can read the translation if they wish in a hand missal or look it up online, a priest from France can go across to Ireland and you can imagine that a Frenchman who finds himself in Ireland would take quite some time to be able to climb up to that level of culture having come from France. Um, but the most important work he has, which is to offer the sacrifice and to pray the office, he can do that straight away on day one, no problem. And the people who attend are perfectly comfortable with it, know exactly where they are. Latin helps us connect with a universal church around all the world, makes us know we're part of something much bigger, that we have the security in our mother, who also transcends the centuries, goes back to the Roman times making us feel all the closer to these two saints. This prayer acknowledges that the saints in heaven are not dead, they're fully alive and they care for the church, they intercede for those of us on earth, especially when we ask them, and especially when we ask them in the liturgy. So he said, may we ever enjoy the loving help of those we honour by this celebration. What happens when you stop the celebration, when you stop saying the mass of these martyrs? It's a disconnect with heaven. And until the rubrics were changed in, I think, 1959, there were very often multiple commemorations in each Mass. We see here the first, where we beseech the Lord God that all his servants, by the glorious intercession of Blessed Mary, always a Virgin, may be delivered from present sadness and enter into the joy of thine eternal gladness. The prayers are realistic that this world is a veil of tears. And if you can feel the sadness, well, we Think of the suffering of St. Chrysanthus and Daria. I mean, they, they really suffered, but they were filled with heavenly joy. So we can get through this veil of tears by keeping our eye on the goal. And part of our sadness is caused by that bishop in white in Rome. The next commemoration here is for the Pope. But by until the liturgical changes, the church would very often be praying for the Pope. Now what's happened since this prayer has been removed from the Mass? This screenshot is taken from the Divinum Officium website, which is a great website. Sometimes there are little mistakes. You can see it says, O God, the shepherd and ruler of all the faithful, graciously look upon thy servant. And they've spelt graciously with a T there. That's maybe not the only mistake, because next they put Francis. And yeah, to be honest, I don't know if he's the Pope or not. Can a man who's constantly acting against the Catholic faith have the Catholic faith? And if he's not Catholic, how can he be Pope? I don't know the answers to that, but God knows, God knows. So we just do the best we can with the liturgy and trust God with the rest. The collect comes just before the epistle and then just before the preface, we have the secret prayer. O Lord, may the offering which your people sacrifice on the anniversary of the death of your holy martyrs, Chrysanthus and Daria, be pleasing to you. Notice here the theme of sacrifice connects both the sacraments and the saints. So the offering we make is the Holy Mass, and it's on the anniversary of the death of the saints whose intercession we've just asked for. The sacrament of Holy Communion is participation in Jesus Christ's sacrifice, and the saints who sacrificed themselves did it for love of Christ in imitation of his passion. So the traditional liturgy is constantly presenting us with sacraments, saints, and connecting them with sacrifice. So for the second secret prayer here, through thy mercy, O Lord, and the intercession of Blessed Mary, ever Virgin, may this oblation obtain for us prosperity and peace both now and forever. Then in the prayer for the Pope, we're beseeching the Lord to look favorably upon the gifts we have offered. And in this context, we ask for God's constant protection for the chief pastor of the church. Again, all of it through Jesus Christ in the unity of the Holy Ghost. 
Then underlining the theme of sacrifice, see the communion prayer here. For if before men they be punished, God tried them as gold in the furnace. He proved them, and as sacrificial offerings, he took them to himself. Then just before the last blessing, we have the post-communion prayer. This is the third time in the Mass where the saints whose feast it is might be named. We read, You have filled us with spiritual joy and delight. Grant, we beseech you, O Lord, that by the intercession of your holy martyrs, Chrysanthus and Daria, we may spiritually attain what we now ritually perform. Again, the intercession of the saints is linked with what we ritually perform. It's by carrying out the liturgy that we give most honor to the saints and to God through the sacrifice and beg the intercession of the saints and God's favor. Now, of course, you can make these prayers anywhere. When you're walking, when you get up, whatever. It's just the liturgy is the way that we do this as a community in Christ according to the seed that he planted and which has developed over the centuries through the guidance of the hierarchy and the saints. And those who can't get to mass every day or who don't pray the office should rejoice that there are people who've been delegated to do that, ministers appointed by God to do it for the sake of the whole church. If it seems complicated, it's why there is um, an hourly pattern when you pray the divine office and there's a daily pattern, there's a weekly pattern, a monthly pattern, a yearly pattern. You get used to it all. It grows on you and you go deeper and deeper into it. So even a seven-year-old can grasp the concepts of the sacrament and also of the saints. Who is better equipped to love Saint Nicholas, for example? A seven-year-old or a 50-year-old with a great education? Well, we don't know who's going to love the most. God knows. But you certainly don't need to understand Latin in order to love St. Nicholas. You don't need to understand the rubrics in order to receive Holy Communion with a full spiritual openness. Like you don't need to know how to fly to get onto a plane or how software works in order to make a call. But you're glad that there are some people who do. And that's their job. Now, there's a symmetry with the collects and the secrets and the post-communion. So if you have three prayers for the first, there will be three throughout. So here in the post-communion, we ask God, grant, O Lord, that we who had partaken of the aids of salvation, that's receiving this grace of the sacrament, may be everywhere protected by the patronage of Blessed Mary, ever-Virgin, in whose honor we have offered these gifts of thy majesty. So again, it's the offering of the gifts we can confidently trust in her patronage and protection. For the Pope, we pray, let the reception of this divine sacrament protect us, O Lord, and also the Pope and the whole Church. Again, we're asking God that the sacrament afford us this protection. The traditional liturgy is perfectly designed and balanced to keep us in mind of heavenly realities. Now let us see what the liturgical changes achieved, and it's quite a devastation, as if the city has been wasted. Sacrosanctum Concilium, flagship document of Vatican II. From paragraph 83, we hear these marvellous truths about the divine office. It's quite well expressed that Jesus Christ, taking human nature, introduced into this earthly exile that hymn which is sung throughout all ages in the halls of heaven, the canticle of divine praise, so that as Jesus ceaselessly praised God the Father, so the church does similarly, not only through the celebration of the Holy Eucharist, but especially by praying the divine office. In paragraph 84, the Sacrosanctum Concilium acknowledges by tradition going back to early Christian times, the divine office is devised so that the whole course of the day and night is made holy by the praises of God. Then it is truly the voice of the bride addressed to her bridegroom. It is the very prayer which Christ himself, together with his body, addresses to the Father. It says this is not just a duty of the church, but the greatest honor of Christ's spouse. And then what follows, I think, is the best 
example of what Vatican II is. If you want to understand Vatican II, look at paragraph 87 and then 89D. In fact, there's a mistake here. They've got 81 instead of 87. It's not the only mistake. It says, in order that the divine office may be better and more perfectly prayed in existing circumstances and carrying further the restoration, they're talking about restoring the liturgy here. What are they going to do to restore the liturgy? And there in 89D, the hour of prime is to be suppressed. Basically, prime is abolished. You remember that was the hour with the martyrology where we're liturgically introduced to the saints whose feast is on the next day. Straight after this, it reads that in choir, the hours of terse, sex and known should be observed. But outside choir, which is the majority of priests, it will be lawful to select any one of these three according to the respective time of the day. That means besides losing prime, you can drop two more hours of the office. And Vatican II's idea is drop prime, lose the martyrology, which is almost forgotten now in the church, just read some places privately, if it's not been horrendously modernized. And two more of the minor hours are made optional and basically neglected. And remember, this follows those glorious paragraphs in the same document saying how important and wonderful the divine office is. The, the document is schizophrenic. King David composed the Psalms 1,000 years before Christ. And in the longest one, Psalm 118 tells us in verse 164, seven times a day I have given praise to thee for the judgments of thy justice. And the church has long understood this to refer to the hours of the divine office from Lords through to Compline. And the same Psalm 118, we read, In the night I have remembered thy name, O Lord, and which is basically Martins, including that reading we had of the saints to tell us about the lives and martyrdom of St. Chrysanthus and Daria. In the new Martins, it's been called something else now, I think, that not the Liturgy of the Minutes, um, I don't know. But you can guarantee that history of St. Chrysanthus and Daria doesn't exist in the Novus Ordo. Or someone correct me in the comments if I'm wrong. And their feast day is gone from the Novus Ordo. As best I understand, on the 25th of October this year, one would repeat the Mass of the Sunday. So as we looked at the Collect and the Secret and the Post Communion, each one with commemoration, so you had three prayers and three prayers and three prayers, Here's the equivalent in the Novus Ordo with the collect, the prayer over the offerings, which is the secret, and the prayer after communion, post-communion. Now, they don't have the beauty and strength of the traditional prayers, but at least you see there in the prayer of the offerings, it is that through the purifying action of your grace, we may be cleansed by the very mysteries we serve. So it retains the truth that it's by God's grace and it's through celebrating the mysteries that this grace is granted primarily to us. And the prayer after communion acknowledges that it's by participating in the heavenly things. But for the Novus Ordo, the martyrology is gone, the reading in Matins is gone, the feast of the two saints is gone, the church lost confidence in her tradition. And then what happens in 2008? It's acknowledged that the legend is real, so that these husband and wife who converted thousands of fellow Romans to the faith, their relics were found when the crypt of a church in Italy was opened, and it was not difficult to tell that one was from a young female and the other from a male about 17 to 18 years old, which was the age of Chrysanthus when he was executed. And everything fits with the honor with which they'd been buried. So let's remember this husband and wife. We hear he was plagued by doubts about the Roman gods and excesses of Roman aristocratic culture from an early age. He converted to Christianity as a teenager. His distressed father tried to win him back to the pagan religion by surrounding him with temptations. When all else failed, he conceived the plan of marrying him to Daria, a beautiful Vestal Virgin. But the plan of Chrysanthus's father backfired when Daria too became a Christian under Chrysanthus's influence. The two married, took a vow of celibacy, and proceeded to spend their time talking to people about Jesus of Nazareth. It said thousands were convinced by their earnestness and youthful charisma and converted to Christianity. The Roman state couldn't allow this state of affairs to continue. It took brutal action, and Chrysanthus and Daria ended up buried alive, and according to tradition, 
Their remains finally came to rest in the Reggio Emilia Cathedral, and this is where the skeletons were found and are being venerated. What I love about all this, about the, the liturgy, is it reminds us constantly that whatever the trials of this life, there's this huge help from heaven, from the sacraments and from the saints, which have in common the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. By the sacrament of Holy Communion, we're participating in Christ's passion spiritually, and by the saints, we look to those who've imitated his life, even to the point of giving up their own lives. With such help from heaven, our own weakness is not going to be a cause of despondency. We're fully aware that we're, we're children and we have Holy Mother Church and Godfather in heaven. And finally, here's a prayer, Pro Concordia Conjugum, for harmony or concord in marriage. Praying to these two wonderful saints, this prayer asks that God who crowned Saints Chrysanthus and Daria with the lily of virginity and the rose of martyrdom in a true and pious harmony, grant that we too by their intercession may be found faithful in constant mutual love and in our religious cult in keeping the honourable liturgy. It is, after all, not complicated. Sacraments and saints or more simply, sacrifice. God bless you all.